A few months ago, there was a guy in my house named Tim Sales. And I spoke with Tim through his interpreter. We had a wonderful conversation. <laughs> and uh, we talked a lot about a lot of things. And I got fascinated with this whole MLM industry. So I thought if you'd have me here, I'll talk to him all about it. So ladies and gentlemen, Tim Sales, come on up. Let's get into it. I'm going to interview Tim, and uh, I hope you found this and find this informative, entertaining, and that you know a lot more when we're done than before we started, because that's what I do for a living. So, Tim, what? Let's get right down to it. Definition: Multi-level marketing is. You have to understand what category it sits inside of. If you and I came up and we had coffee cups to sell. We have to figure out how to sell it. Where do we get it out there? We could go to a store. We could go on the internet. We could go direct mail. We could go infomercials. We can go direct sales. Okay, direct sales is without a retail store. It's person to person communication. Inside of direct sales is an industry called multi-level marketing. Which does? Which does, it, does direct sales. This sells well, a product. So we have direct sales, then, and multi-level marketing is part of direct sales. Yes, multi-level marketing just merely is describing how the salesperson is compensated. All right, so every, every direct sales has multi-level marketing. Not necessarily. Every direct sales sells a product directly. Right. But some of them might only pay one, one person or one level, but others might pay many levels. And so it's really just, it's an esoteric term to describe how the product or how the person is compensated for selling a product. When is it most beneficial then to use direct sales? When the product or service that you have needs an explanation or needs a demonstration. Since you can't do that in a store That's or right. on television. You could do it on television, couldn't you? You could demonstrate yeah. a product. Yeah. You see that on infomercials sometimes right. where they're trying to demonstrate it. Um, <clears throat> like sometimes, you know, a person likes to walk around a store, you know. Sometimes a person likes to thumb through a catalog. Sometimes a person likes to click around a website. Some people like to ask questions of a person who's knowledgeable about it. So the, the, the difference between direct sales and MLM is? The difference between direct sales and MLM. All right, let's suppose that we figured out a way to extract nutrients out of grapes. We want to get that product out there. So we find a sales rep, all right? The sales rep goes out and gets 500 customers. That's direct sales. And here's the real crux, Larry. This is, the, this is that logical thing that you have to understand to even put a value on multi-level marketing. And that is, is that if once I've got a person who's out there selling the product, is it better for me, the owner or the inventor, to go out and find another sales rep myself? Or is it better to take the existing sales rep and have him or her find other reps? And if it's him or her finding other reps, then that's multi-level marketing, basically being paid or compensated got on it. more than one level. So it's a method to compensate the direct sales person. That's, just, that's all it is, yeah. So it's, it's me getting you as a distributor, you get him, he gets him. Correct, right. that's, not, that's incomplete, but yes. All right, how's it different from a more traditional business? In a more traditional business, a couple of different ways. One would be, uh, I actually call the traditional business multi-width marketing, meaning that if a sales manager is hired, he has sales reps, right? And then when that sales manager is overwhelmed by all the activity by the sales reps, then the company will hire another sales manager and other sales reps. So that's multi-width. Right. And all multi-level is, is, is that you take one of those people that is a sales reps and you allow that person to get others and train them. 
Well, one of the problems, though, that I've always heard with the industry is, is it more important to get the rep than the product and to sell the product? It begins, how many reps do I have rather than how good my product is? You've heard that, huh? Yeah. All right. And so, is there a question in there? Well, the question is... <laughs> You'll never be back. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm veering off here. The question is, I'm more likely to say, boy, I have 7,000 distributors, then this is a great product. My money comes from my distributors, and I forget my product. Okay. The question is, can that happen? Yes, it can. And it's an area that I feel as though needs some correction. I want to uh, show you a diagram real quick, just so that you can kind of see my view. So the ideal model would be you, the distributor, gets customers, right? All right. And then you get an agent, and then you help them get customers. Right. If that doesn't occur, if, if you don't get customers, and then you get an agent, what can you teach them to do? Sell the product. You can't get them to sell the product because you never got customers yourself, so you don't know how to teach them to get customers. Well, I'm depending on them to teach them. That's right. That's the whole point that I'm making. See, you have to yourself be able to get customers, not a lot, 10 to 20, mm -hmm. right? And then you bring somebody in the business and then you teach them how to get 10 to 20 customers and so forth. All right. What's the, is there a defect in the MLM? A defect yeah. in the what, structure. Is there anything itself, wrong with it? In the structure itself, no. I uh, I don't see anything wrong with the structure. It's is brilliant. It, is the there structure. Any, anything wrong in the playing? Yeah, it's the activities, right? So it's not any different than baseball or anything else. Baseball is gorgeous, right? It's brilliant, but the the activity sometimes. So some of the activities that I think need correction would be the lack of training and the lack of that focus of of getting customers. And so you, uh, is your job to teach that? Is that what you do? Well, no one gave me the job. I volunteered the job. Uh, but, um... <laughs> well, you went from uh, looking for underwater bombs, right? That's what you used to do. Yes, sir. Now, I would imagine not many Navy SEALs or underwater bomb demolition experts Want to want to sell products or deal in this kind of industry? What? How did you get into this? Um, I wanted more. You know, like like in my uh, when I would uh, there was a, a buddy of mine named Randy, and he and I used to drive around when we lived in Fort Lauderdale. We were stationed there, and we would drive around in the boats, and we would see these big houses. And I used to think. You know, how do you get that? You know, how do you become that? So uh, I wanted more and uh, answered an ad in the newspaper and said, you know, uh, gosh, I think I can do this. Why not? I can do uh, some other things that I didn't think I could do. Why not? So for me, it was just stepping out and doing something different. What changes would you like to see in the MLM business? I'd like to go back so that I can explain that. I want to go back to this getting customer thing because there's, uh, there's a particular area that I, if, I, if I zone you in on, you'll understand what I need to change, okay? Um, because I am connected to so many companies, hundreds of companies and hundreds of different leaders, I see from my perspective that it's really falling into three categories. And the, and the way I'll label the categories is ratios of customers to distributors, all right? ratio. So one way is what I call the 80-20 rule, and that is, is that the focus is 80% on getting customers, 20% on getting distributors. And those are like the party plan types of companies. The media loves them, everything's great with them. The second group of people are the 50-50, and that is, is they get 50% 50, 50 of their time is focused on getting customers, and 50% of their time is focused on getting distributors. Builds a solid business, media doesn't have a problem with them. Now this third part, and that is the 20-80 the rule, and that is, is that only 20% of their time or less is focused on getting customers, and 80% is on getting distributors. 
And this is where people think, oh, that's a scam. Uh, that's it's a, a bad image. It's yeah, the, yeah. Because I'm, I'm, that's the pyramid thing. That's right. I, I'm interested not in the product, just in you and you and you and you and you being my distributors. That's right. How do and we so, correct that? So that's what I want to change. And number one, the way that we need to change that is proper training, uh, proper publicity, because if uh, even within this room here, Larry, you're going to have some of these people who are doing the 80-20. In other words, they don't even know about sponsoring other people. They're just, they just love the product, right? And then there's other people, <laughs> there they are, right? And then there's other people who have more of a focus on the business side of it, and so that's what they do. Right? So sometimes a company can be divided in its methods. Okay. All right, now I want to tell you something. The, the 20 80 rule, uh -huh. right, the 20% focus, it's not illegal. Even though it might drum up in your mind something of a pyramid scheme, uh, this is a letter from the Federal Trade Commission, okay? And it specifically says the amount of internal consumption. All right, so that means that each one of these people, they bring somebody in the business and they're consuming the product only and finding others to consume the product only. Okay, the amount of internal consumption in any multi-level compensation business does not determine whether or not the FTC will consider the plan a pyramid scheme. Okay, so it's not illegal, but it is unconventional. And it looks a little bit like a pyramid scheme, and so therefore, people get this idea. Well, it must be a scheme, must be a scam. Well, I'm, I'm listening to that, but if 80% if of my people are distributors and 20% are customers, that don't play out. I got more distributors than customers. I got more people out pushing something than selling it. I'm, it's confusing to me. What is a pyramid? What is if a that's not a pyramid, what's a pyramid? I love it when you do that. That's what I try to do. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I can do it with this. All right. If there is no product whatsoever, right? Let me just uh, no put this. No product. No product. All right. So there was a pyramid back in the late 1970s, 80s. It was called the airplane game. And what it was, I'm going to draw this one, is, is that you got two people and when you got two people in the business and I'm going to tell you what you're going to do with them but just a second when you get two people you were called a co-pilot all right now what did you ask the two people to do you ask them to invest fifteen hundred dollars each all right so they invest fifteen hundred dollars and you invested fifteen hundred dollars now why did you invest it right to play the game okay when you help them each get two then that was called crew. And then when you helped them each get two, that was called passenger. And you were then promoted to pilot and you got $10,000 in cash paid to you for an investment of $1,500. That's, a, that's a, a letter. That's the old... It's a pyramid scheme. That is the definition of a pyramid scheme. There's no product. There is no product. This right here, if you multiply this out, $1,500 times, and there's eight people here, times eight comes out to be about $12,000. That means that $2,000 went up the line to the administrator of the scheme, and $10,000 was paid off here, and that's the scheme. In other words, there's no product, Larry. So eventually, there'd be one guy left in the country. Maybe, <laughs> or all of a sudden, the FTC comes in, shuts it down, and then all of that money immediately Goes, goes lost. Bernie Madoff. That was a scheme, right? That was a Ponzi scheme. Like that's, it, that's, that's different than this, but it is a scheme. And we sometimes get looked at that way by someone who really doesn't understand. All right, let me explain a Ponzi scheme so that uh, it doesn't happen to you. <laughs> but it did. I was Madoff. <laughs> I was, I was, I'm, that's generally known. I was Madoff. You, you, are, you were Madoff, meaning that you gave Madoff money. Mm -hmm. And he gave me back a lot of money along the way. So while at the end I lost some, but along the way I got back because to successfully do a Ponzi scheme, you have to pay people back when they ask for it. That's the magician's act. That you have to do. In other words, the magician's act is, is that you make it look authentic, meaning that people of your credibility can ask for their money back and they get it. But you didn't ask for all of it. No. All right, here's a Ponzi scheme. 
Here's a Ponzi scheme. People going into the administrator, all right? So this is the administrator, all right? And people coming out. As long as you have more people coming in to the system. So, you know, this person puts in a million dollars, this person puts in, and this person wants a million dollars. As long as you've got more going in than coming out. This is known as the pipe. Going, if you've got more people going in the pipe than coming out of the pipe, you're fine. But as soon as too many of these people ask for their money back, that's when the administrator realizes he can't cover it. Wait a minute, you told me this. That sounds like a bank. <laughs> If, if everybody, why do you think the printing press is running wide open in the United States right if now? If every depositor in the bank wanted their money back tomorrow, the bank is a Ponzi, right? It exactly don't have it because right. it's taken in more than it's given out. That's exactly right. But it's legal. It is legal, and you know why? And do you know why it won't collapse? Because the government, the government can print the money. Right. To bail it out. Yeah. And That's to help the guy on the street who put the money in. Yeah, see, in this scenario, you don't have any more money coming in. But what if you had a printing press over here? You can just crank out a couple of trillion dollars anytime but that, you want. The government has to do that to protect you. Would protect you not us. want the government to do that? Would you want the government to say to all the people who got screwed by the bank, you're screwed? As opposed to what? Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. Federal Deposit, that's great. But right now, I think there's $65 trillion put into banks, and there's only about $10.8 billion set aside for FDIC. So, what so if everybody you, pulled out... What would your answer be then? To? Screw the people? That's tricky, the way you ask that. <laughs> um, <laughs> you think it's funny. Um, you have to have some protection when you're dealing with a massive amount of people who put something into something, don't you? I mean, or we're yes. a country to help each other. We are our brother's keeper. Absolutely. And given the situation, in other words, if I had my finger on the, on the panic That's switch That's an here, unusual situation, Right. Obviously. I would have to look across and say, all right, my choice is, is print out some money Give it out in terms of, you know, make everybody pay taxes in order to pay it off down the road. Right. Or we collapse this entire economy right now. Well, yeah, I would have to take the choice of saying let's print more money and let's worry about it later because we're in an emergency right, right now. Right. So. Let's go back to the normal though. This business. Okay. Let's what please is, do that. Is the biggest danger this business faces image? Is it the biggest yeah. issue? It comes about because of a couple of true problems and several non-true problems or untrue problems. Okay, so, so yeah, it, it is an image issue. But the non-true problems are what? In other words, this is like, it's an image that's not true. Correct. And so when the media, and, uh, and I'm not specifically talking about you, but I'm talking about uh, the media that do go out and print, people who do go out and, and say, make statements, they don't do enough research to be able to differentiate. And so they just, they make a statement or they create an association. They'll say uh, the name of a company like a pyramid scheme, or it works like a pyramid where one gets another gets another. If they don't, if they haven't been educated on the difference, then they'll, they'll, they'll associate it to a, a scam. And that's not true, and it's not fair. But what does the co what does this company do? Well, it continues to be successful, and it takes it takes what, by what it does. It, it, it takes the hit when occasionally it mentions that this company is somewhat like the pyramid scheme. Okay, it takes the hit and goes on, right? That's what correct. else can it do? Get smarter, get more educated, get better tools, get better explanations. Uh, explain it, show them law, show them case law where it's been proven. You know, there's a ton of companies publicly traded, right? So obviously it's legal. Uh, Senator Hatch over, over, oversees this, this state. He's not going to allow all these schemes to be in Utah if it's illegal, right? So it must be legitimate.
because the, the, the product is legit, it must be frustrating then to be in the business. No, I'm saying seriously, to be in the business and see something printed like that, you know, like a pyramid. You just made me the happiest man in the world because you finally can see what I've experienced because I know it's legitimate, right? There's no doubt in my mind. How does a weak economy affect this business, MLM? It actually uh, bolsters it, yeah. Wait a minute, we're applauding a weak economy? We are. <laughs> yeah. Walk people out of work, yes! <laughs> Recession, yahoo! <laughs> Explain that. All right, I will. This, uh, this better be good. <laughs> this is the, uh, an Associated Press survey. The average CEO in 2006 made $10 million a year. The average worker for those companies made $29,000 a year. Okay? So during a bad economy, they lay off these workers, right? That's forced entrepreneurship oftentimes, meaning that now the person says, well, what else am I gonna do? If I go down and put in my resume at this company, there's 15 other guys sitting right in front of me. How do I get a job? And so they become a little more focused. They become a little more resourceful. And then they wanna own their own business. And that's all these people are in business for themselves. Every one of them, they're all in business for themselves. Is the guy at the top who started it, still making more disproportionately than them. You mean like that? Yeah, like that. Or like that? Each level earns less in a corporation? All right, let me explain the way it works in this industry. If, if I'm on the top, as you called it, how did I get there? You started it. Uh, did I start it? Well, I assume you started Okay, it. I started a company that was five years old. I started in a company that was five years old, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, I step in. I've got no one beneath me, as you're calling it. I'm not at the top of anything. I'm at the bottom of something, right? Well, how did I get on top of, uh, of anything? I had to build it. Every business owner in this country had to build what's Correct. below them. All right, so now, Here's something ironic, and I hope you hear it fully, and that is, is that there's someone on my third level, three levels below me, who makes more money than me. That's true. That's completely true. Because there's no auto worker making more than the head of GM. Yes. <laughs> You're right. You're absolutely right. And one of the fallacies of that is that the auto worker, while he shouldn't make more, but deserves a better piece of the pie. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. Because of what they do, right? Correct, and, and they it's build the, same the car. Here. Yeah, well the same here. And that is, is that if, let me explain this to you a little bit so that, uh, that you can think it, because you said, is that true? And uh, I'll tell you this, I probably have worked closely with a 200 companies, and I have never seen one where the first person to join the company is making the most money in the company. Really? Really, not a one. Is it true here? Absolutely, the first so, person isn't making the most money. What you're saying is, there could be a new distributor found today who two years from today can make more than anybody in this place. That's exactly right. When you explain it that way, yeah. it's legit. It is legit. If I want to work harder, yeah. I can do better. And let me tell you why. It's what I put into it. That's exactly right. Let me tell you why. Because if, and, the, and, and there's two different compensations, and I don't want you to get confused by it, so I'm going to make it real simple. You get paid on a number of levels are uh, of sides, okay? And so the company is basically going to say to you, is, is that we give you a certain like area and if you build more volume, meaning sell more products, inside that area, 
you'll make more money than the person that brought you in. So everyone gets the fair I got shot. It. I got it. Well put. The most important thing still, though, is the product better be good, right? Yeah. You betcha. Because a sharp distributor, a sharp salesman, as we all know, can sell a less, an inferior product through the, their own ability. That's right. The product has to be good. That's right. you don't get repeat sales. But the problem is, is that this room is not filled full of slick salespeople. Yeah, this, do you have to be a good salesman? Yeah, they're not slick salespeople. What they are is they're real people. They're like me and you. And they have a good experience with a product and they want to go share it. And so they share it with someone. They're not slick salespeople here. And so a, 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 a typical, a really good MLM company has a product that causes a person to say, I want to continue to take, take this. And when that occurs, you get that repeat business. How do you, how do you choose an MLM company? What I look for in a company, number one is, is the company going long term? It's the first question I ask, okay? Now, what I don't do is uh, I have to look at that first. I don't care, I don't wanna be in on the ground floor as a lot of the, the pitch people say because I wanna make sure the company's going long term because if I'm gonna show this to friends and family, I don't want them hurt. I don't want them, you know, looking, it looking bad. So that's number one, is the company going long term? Number two is does the product sell outside the network? All right, you got to understand this one, okay? If this is a Christmas tree, and inside of here is people building, they're, they're moving their volume, selling products, things like that. If the business doesn't sell products outside of the business, meaning to a legitimate customer, then the FTC deems that a pyramid scheme. In other words, they will ask the question, why is the distributor ordering the product? And if it is to hold a position inside of the business, then that they will deem a pyramid scheme. Okay, so the product has to sell outside the network, meaning does somebody who doesn't want anything to do with the business, will they want the product? And if the answer to that is yes, then that checks off Point number two of my criteria. Number three, I want to be compensated well for my efforts. All right. Some companies, they create like religious overtones. They create different things to try to retain people because the amount of money that's actually being paid out to the distributors is so small that they, they do other things to try to retain them. So I want to make sure that I'm going to be paid well for my efforts. All right. Gotcha. Okay. So that is, and, and, and then the final one, and this is the order, the sequence that I recommended, is whether or not there's good training. And there's only one test of good training, and that is, is that after the training, can the person do it? That's the only test of training. And I learned that in the bomb squad. I'll if bet. we defused a bomb and it, <laughs> the, guy, the guy didn't come back, we would say, hey, let's find out what he did. We don't want to do that. Right? Good test. Yeah. <laughs> We're smart, you know. <laughs> it's obvious in meeting you, and this is obvious, we've got a few more things to ask. You love MLM. I mean, you love it. Why? I always had this intrigue by how people could have so much. And so with that, I had one problem, is, and that is, is, who would teach me? Who was out there to teach me? And so when I got into MLM, there was someone who took an interest. And then I was able to, to go to like a convention like this and I would go up and I would ask somebody and then they would give me some advice. So there was someone to teach me. I went from making about $2,000 a month, less than 2,000, to $150,000 a month. You really wanna know why I love MLM? It's because it, like, it makes people open up and, and be more responsible to society. I've now donated more. I've now helped more organizations. Is I that why do, you do what you do now? Yes. Because you don't have to do this now, right? That's right. Yeah, I want to be the, like, the ambassador that brings, like, like there's not a public relations firm, right? Do you realize that? That this industry operates out there and there's not a public relations firm that's going to help because we're all the public relations firm. 
Yeah. And so I have to get in and train each person and help that person understand that they can't make product claims, that they can't make income claims, that they've got to be first class, they've got to be professional. And if they do, we are the greatest public relations group in the world. So that's what I do. I've had a lot of fun here this morning. Thank you, me too. <laughs> I've enjoyed asking these questions. And uh, great working with you. And I know you want me to do a little more, so yeah. what do you want to say? All right. Thank you.